Okay, let's get into spatial inequality. Where do you live? Who's around you? And is that really equitable? Let's take a look. So, race, residential segregation refers to the separation of groups into different neighborhoods. So that, that, that's not a new premise. We understand we all live in different neighborhoods. So that's a, that's a common occurrence. But now we're going to look at what are some of the drivers behind that, right? So residential segregation is most commonly based on three main drivers that we're going to talk about. The first and probably most obvious would be racial differences. The second, ethnic differences. And third is socioeconomic drivers or differences. So that includes things like affluence and education. Now, we know that when re uh, residential segregation occurs, it's not because laws have been enforced. Typically, it's more on social patterns based on suburbanization, discrimination, and personal preference. Imagine you are moving to a new city and you're taking a look at the neighborhoods and I'm just going to, you know, pick a minority. You're a visible minority. So say you're, you're Indian and you're going into a predominantly white uh, town, but there's a small subpopulation or a small little neighborhood of other fellow Indians. Uh, now, as a immigrant coming in, where would you feel most comfortable? I think a lot of times your personal preference would be that I would like to be with other Indians so I can communicate, I might have access to the different amenities that I need. In that case, that's more of a personal preference. As opposed to when you come into a neighborhood and they tell you, well, no, this is where your kind lives, so you'll be living in that area. So that's sort of the difference between preference versus discrimination. Now, we can actually do a little bit of math based on the data that's available and calculate something called index of dissimilarities. This is the level of segregation, with zero being total segregation, and 100 indicating a perfect heterogeneous distribution. So at zero, we'd have drawn lines. All of these types of people are over here, all of these types of people are over here, and at 100, there's a nice perfect mix of everybody. So um, what we know is that uh, levels of residential segregation increase based on stereotypes, discrimination, and social tension. So when you have this segregation, and like I said, we can calculate that, the more segregation we have, the more stereotypes, the more discrimination, and more tension. And, and that makes sense. Think of two neighborhoods. And one neighborhood might not like the other neighborhood or might have preconceived um, stereotypes about that other neighborhood. And they might say, well, I don't want to really live there. And that, that transitionary area where these two neighborhoods maybe meet or we have some overlap, you, you might see some of the issues in terms of safety and violence. Now... Um, let's take a look at um, what happens when these three variables uh, interact. So when you have these neighborhoods where you have segregation, you can actually create something called social isolation, which is you, you stay within your group. And socially speaking, you've created a subcategory within the broader society. And so you've isolated yourself. You created yourself a little island of individuals that belong to your social circle. It also creates something called linguistic isolation and cultural isolation. Now, you see this a lot of times in a lot of cities around the globe where they have, um, say, a Chinatown. And a lot of the signage is in, um, is in, in Mandarin uh, or Chinese. And you have uh, restaurants, grocery stores, and a lot of the people actually only speak um, that language and don't speak the other language that is the predominant language for, say, that city. Um, this also creates cultural isolation where the individuals in that culture basically emulate the same cultures that they have in their uh, originating country. So I'm using um, Chinese and Chinatown as an example. So they might bring some of the cultures that they have in China to this donor city where they've set up uh, a Chinatown. And so that's created this little island effect. Now, we know that this can increase the incidence of violence and crime um, with surrounding areas because of that potential tension and that difference and that discrimination. And also within that um, subpopulation, if that subpopulation falls within a lower SES aggregate, then you can get this, um, uh, this violence as well. So these different factors can all escalate neighborhood safety and violence. Now, this is not to say that every Chinatown has a lot of violence and that's why we have violence. We're simply highlighting that when you create these socially isolated islands that have their own culture and their own, um, their own norms that differs from those around them, it sparks the potential for conflict, and it also sparks the potential for crime. 
Now, um, differences between neighborhood composition may impact access uh, to law enforcement as well. So back to some of the drivers behind what's creating these neighborhoods, one of those was socioeconomic status. And we know from our other discussions that in terms of SES, if you are on the lower end of the SES scale, you tend to have um, lower paying jobs, lower quality of life, you tend to have rougher jobs, less education, and less access to social resources. And, and some of those include things like police stations and shelters and uh, actual law enforcement and ensuring safety of that neighborhood versus, say, a highly affluent area where you have lots of police, you have lots of shelters, lots of resources there. And so that disparity, that difference, can actually lead to increase in safety and violence issues. Now, we're going to approach a topic called environmental justice. And this refers to the trend that people that are on the lower on the SES scale have less access to environmental assets and higher presence of negative environmental factors. So what are some of the things that I'm talking about? So on the green side, so on the environmental side, these are assets like things like parks, green spaces, bike paths, places to go take your dog, play with your kids, um, and also some social support services. So linked to that greenery, um, a lot of money, generated from the taxes are put into creating these play spaces and these, um, these places for you to enjoy yourself. Now, coming with that is the ability to do things like, well, hey, I have a park. I can go play with my kids or I can go for a bike ride. I can go for a run. And it's giving you the opportunity to actually um, reinforce the positive health outcomes that we see with those that are higher on the SES scale. Now, negative environmental factors can include things like the processing plant for garbage and dumps. Um, factories, energy production, uh, transportation hubs, so airports, trucks, train stations, these tend to fall around areas where you see um, lower economic sta status. So I have this kind of graph for you so you can kind of make some sense. Now, on the x-axis, you will see level of SES. On one end, you have the affluent wealthy folks uh, higher on the SES scale, and on, on the other end, we have those that are a little bit lower on the SES scale. Now, if you were to graph this out, you'd see a relationship looking at, say, the environmental assets. So this is your parks and, and, and green spaces that we see more of those assets in individuals that are higher on the SES scale, and you see less of it in those that are lower on the SES scale. And in terms of the negative factors, things like the factories, the transit, uh, airports, housing around the, all those broader areas, that, that's not a very nice place to live, and we see that the negative factors being much higher on the lower SES scale versus the uh, more affluent neighborhoods. We see less things like um, airports and, and big industrial factories. So this disparity reinforces what we know in terms of health risks uh, and it's based on environmental assets, negative factors, and location. So to sum it all up, if you're lower on the SES scale, you have less access to sort of things that would improve your quality of life and your health outcomes versus those that are higher on the SES scale.